Good morning. If we lived in another climate, our souls might speak other languages. We might speak oasis or permafrost, dry season or monsoon, but our souls speak spring. Our souls speak green shoots pushing through last year's leaves. Our souls speak flower buds stretching to sun. Our souls speak mud puddle and nest building, damp earth and worm castings, tiny green leaves and frog choruses. We speak spring because spring sings in us. We gather to nurture our faith in our own growing, our own courage to push through, our own blossoming in beauty, our own small part in the spring of this world. Come, let us worship together. Welcome to our special guest service, exploring the power of Passover for all of us with Rabbi Laura Geller. This morning's service will explore some of the key themes of Passover, focusing on how Passover touches the historical, the political, the spiritual, and the dim emotional dimensions of what it means to come out of a narrow place and how it challenges us to ask what it means to say, Dayenu, I have enough. I'm the Reverend Jeremiah Lal Shabazz Kalande, and I serve this congregation as its developmental minister. We light our flaming chalice this morning, symbol of our liberal and liberating faith, with the responsive prayer for the world, which I've adapted by Amy Petri Shaw. You're invited to respond to each line of the prayer with these words. We lift up our hearts. For all who die in war, we lift up our hearts. For all who live in suffering in the aftermath of violence, we lift up our hearts. For all who give their lives in smoke and flame, we lift up our hearts. For all who go on in honor of the dead, we lift up our hearts. For all who have served, for our country and our world. For a planet that will find peace. For the young and the innocent. For the weary and war-torn. For those who would pray. For those too angry to cry. For all of us, for the many names of God. Shanti, shalom, salam. May peace prevail upon the earth.
Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Santa Monica. Our whole worship team is delighted to be joining you for our service here this morning in our historic sanctuary and online. Our special guest worship leader this morning is the Rabbi Laura Geller, Rabbi Emerita of Temple Emmanuel of Beverly Hills. Prior to becoming one of the first women to be selected through a national search to lead a major metropolitan synagogue, Rabbi Geller served as the director of Hillel of University of Southern California for 14 years and as the Pacific Southwest region's executive director of the Jewish American Congress for five, four years. She was featured in the PBS documentary, Jewish Americans. Author of numerous articles in books and journals, she was on the editorial board of the Torah, a women's commentary. She has twice been named one of Newsweek's 50 most influential rabbis in America and was named by PBS Next Avenue as one of the 50 2017 influencers on aging. Ordained by Hebrew Union College in 1976, she is the third woman in the reform movement to be ordained a rabbi. Her current project is creating the Synagogue Village Network it's truly an honor to have such a historic liberal li religious leader joining us this morning. Let us offer her our warm welcome. The Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Santa Monica is an open, I almost said synagogue, is an open and affirming congregation welcoming queer and transgender people, and people from many diverse and beautiful backgrounds, identities, and abilities. And we live into our commitments to intersectionality, anti-racism, and countering oppressions to build a community that is radically inclusive, whole, just, and sustainable. We celebrate many religious beliefs and learn from wisdom both ancient and contemporary, sacred and secular. We offer ministries and programs to serve the needs of our congregation and to be of service to the larger world, including our chalice circle, small group ministries, weekly meditation meetings, book clubs, children's and youth religious education classes, and activities for people of all ages. We join with other social and environmental justice activists to promote love, peace, and equity among people and care for our hurting planet home. There's truly something for everyone here. We invite you to consider becoming a member of our congregation to help us in its transformative work in our world. May you find inspiration, comfort, and beloved community here. Now we recognize that our historic sanctuary and our homes, many of our homes, are located near the sacred waters, beneath the sacred skies and upon the holy and unceded lands and territories of indigenous people. This is the traditional home of the Tongva, the Quiche, the Gabrieleno, the Shumash, the Fernandeno, and others, and we remember their presence among us, the painful histories of this land, and the ongoing struggle for equity, justice, and sovereignty. We have a few brief announcements this morning. Is anyone here interested in getting good at getting older? <laughs> I just turned 42 and I'm feeling ready for it. I don't know about the rest of you. Uh, Rabbi Geller is gonna offer a special workshop as one of our influencers in aging nationally after the service at noon in the sanctuary on this topic of getting good at getting older. And she's also gonna have copies of her latest book available to purchase, so be sure to pick up a copy. I'd like to offer a special thanks to Beth Rendero. Uh, I don't know, is Beth, are you here? To Beth Rendero for organizing this event um, and for she and... <laughs> and to she and Stephen for providing some food and refreshments for those who are able to attend this afternoon. We are grateful, thank you. Our stewardship campaign. April is the month of our annual stewardship campaign which we launched last Sunday. This year's campaign is entitled Leading with Our Abundance as we prepare to meet the many challenges next church year may bring to our wider culture and the issues that we care about the most. 
please be sure to stop by our stewardship table in the courtyard and pick up your pledge packet. When you return your packet, we have a special pin that we've designed this year for the congregation by our extremely talented Gretchen Getz. Uh, we also have house parties happening throughout the month, so please be sure to sign up for one of those or attend our connecting conversation in the front courtyard on Sunday, April 28th. You, you, the vote. It's that time again. It's once again time for us to engage in our congregation-wide postcard writing campaign that encourages voters throughout the U.S. who are traditionally marginalized to vote. Come join us at, uh, for UU The Voters Sundays at 9 a.m. under the shade structure in the courtyard outside to learn more. Uh, our group will be gathering to prepare post postcards until um, November. I believe we, we, together we sent around five to 6,000 letters last year, or in the last major election cycle, and we're hoping to do the same again this time around. And we can only do that with everyone's participation, and this really makes a difference to help drive uh, voting participation throughout the country. Uh, and then I, have, I would like to offer an invitation to Lars Kieseth to give a short announcement. Actually, the choir doesn't have a problem. We have an opportunity for you. We've got an opportunity this Friday to come and join us at our spring concert, which in this season of stewardship is about how we steward, the steward how we take care of the world that we live in. And so this year's theme is Songs to Save the World. So we're inviting you all to come this Friday evening at 7 p.m. Now, this is the first year we have tried, uh, with some mixed results, to um, uh, sell tickets ahead of time. And uh, we fixed some things, some problems with it. We had meant to uh, give a, have a sort of a suggested price of $25 per ticket. But as in the past, we really don't mean that you have to pay $25 if you can't afford it. So even online now, you can choose to donate what you are able, or you can come on Friday night, and at the door you can do the same thing. $25 is what we suggest, but give what we can. We'd rather have you here than not to celebrate together. So I'm going to be out at the table if you have questions about um, getting tickets using Eventbrite or any questions you have after um, the service today. So thank you very much. And this morning we also have our courageous chair of stewardship. I think courageous is the right word this year, Denise Helton, who will share uh, her stewardship testimonial with us this morning to hopefully inspire us in our abundance and in recognizing the many blessings of our lives. That's a hard act to follow, Lord. <laughs> Hi, everybody. It's great to see so many of you here on what was a dismal day. It's um, really nice to be here. It's great to, I love hearing the stories of why people came to this church. And I love even more hearing what keeps them here over, through the years and the kind of uh, involvement and commitment that, they have been, that they've evolved into through the years. I came here many years ago, almost 20 years ago, when Judith Meyer was the minister. And I had no intention of joining a church. I'd never really been part of a church in my life. And Judith's sermon just blew my mind. It was so beautiful, it was so moving, it was so brilliant, and I just loved her. And then the choir and, and sang, and they were so beautiful and lovely. And it really made, it really helped me through a very dark time in my life. And fortunately, our music has just gotten better and better through the years. It's just more beautiful and inspiring. So um, it, I sat way in the back far corner when I came so I could dart out the back door as soon as the service was over. I didn't want to talk, I didn't want to visit, I just wanted to come here, engage with 
here at this moment and leave. And then one day my friend Gerald Saldo, who had been coming here for quite a while with his family, said, come into Forbes Hall, come into Forbes Hall. And I did. And uh, I talked to Judith. She was leaning against a wall and drinking some coffee. And I went up to her and she said, hi, I introduced myself. She said, you sit in the far right corner, don't you? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I, I, that's me. And she goes, well, I think we're fellow introverts and whatever, and come and talk to me. Uh, so I went to talk to her and from that point on, I got involved with what we called then heart to heart circles, which were groups that you had deep listening and connecting with people. And um, I met women in that group that are still my friends all these years later. And then I became a facilitator for those groups, and now they're called Chow Circles. And now with uh, Betty Barclay and Cheryl Barnett, we, we are the, facil the managers of that group, that we get facilitators together and uh, kind of help to design the program. And it has been a very rich part of my life. Um, when Rebecca came on board, I was asked to be on the personnel committee because of my uh, background in human resources. And that was a very challenging committee at the time. And I met wonderful people on that committee as well. And we were real problem solvers and we worked really hard. And um, I also became a greeter and that was very fun, and some people I still see today, including Eileen, I think I greeted her the first day she ever came here, so that's very exciting. And then after that, Jeremiah came, and I became a pastoral associate, and uh, that has been one of the most rewarding experiences I've had here. Um, doing that, and I'm trying to think, I also worked with taking food to the homeless shelter once a month, and that that we stopped doing that program, but I, I love doing that. Um, so my involvement has kind of evolved in a very slow and steady and kind of contemplative way, and it suits my temperament. And that's how I tell people when I talk to them. You can, very social people, there's so many things you can take part in. And for less social people, you can, or project-oriented people, or people that want to work on something, there's plenty to do here in that way. Um, we each have our own way of being involved, and we each have our own gifts to give. And I think that this is not a time, this is a critical year for us, in that it, it's bringing to the end of uh, uh, Reverend Jeremiah's developmental ministry, and we, are beginning, we will begin the search for a settled minister. And I will say that it is just not a time to step away. It is a time to move forward, to gather, to be closer, and to really, really let us know in one of the groups or in our final conversation group on the final Sunday of this month, what it is that you're concerned about, what it is you value, how you want to be involved, the improvements you want for our church, so that we can really move forward in strength and abundance in, in the years to come. Um, thank you. And I hope to see you at the greeters table. Come, or at my, not, I mean, I'll be there next week too. But you can be at the stewardship table and pick up your packet or sign up, please, for one of the upcoming events. And because we do require an RSVP, if you could do that, we will keep track of those and get back to you about those events. We'd love you to be there. And um, if you're not a member and would like information, we'll give that to you. And if by chance you want an individual session with somebody just to talk to them, let us know, and we can arrange that as well. So thank you all, and I'm really happy to have this role. Great. Thank you for that powerful testimonial and sharing, Denise. I am inspired by your leadership. Now let's take a, a few moments to rise in body or spirit and greet those who have joined us for our service this morning.
Now let us rise or remain standing in body or this, in oh. spirit for our opening hymn, and then remain standing for our covenant and song of praise. Let us join together in singing hymn number 392 in your gray hymnals, Hine Matov. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for people to dwell together. And we will sing it in Hebrew and then in English. Uh, act, sorry, one, one, one quick thing. We're doing it as a round. Uh, we're only going to be doing the Hebrew uh, lyrics. Um, so just a, it's, it'll be, it's an easy one. Um, so we're singing the whole thing through once with, uh, if you're looking at your hymnal, part one, repeat, part two, repeat. And then uh, if you identify as a soprano or alto, you will be following Chloe and Javon here uh, for the first, right after that singing. And then uh, us tenors and basses will be coming in um, on one at the beginning when they get to two. You'll see. Don't worry about it too much. All right. <laughs> yes. Yes, thank you. Um, okay. Indeed. Let us begin.
If you have a donation for the West Side Food Bank, we ask that you bring it forward to place it in our basket at this time. Note, I've moved the basket over here so it's a little bit away from the chalice, so let's try to bring the food over here. Um, we have been partners in collecting food for the West Side Food Bank for many years. If you'd like to donate food, please bring items they use in large quantities like pasta, pasta sauce, and unbreakable packaging, juice, granola bars, protein bars, or breakfast cereal. Our service to the world can be embodied right here each Sunday. All people, young people, and adults are encouraged to give. We'll now receive this, these gifts of food for the West Side Food Bank. Uh, we have Children's Chapel in the cottage this morning, so there will be no time for all ages. If any of our young people or their parents would like to attend Children's Chapel, they can um, make their way across the courtyard over to the cottage, and you're most welcome to attend or to remain here in the service. And we'll sing our hymn of praise, or hymn of blessing. We have one joy to share with the community as we transition to our time for mindfulness, prayer, and meditation. Stephen DePaul has published his second rock and roll mystery novel, Frequently Asked Questions. And it's available on Amazon, so be sure to check it out. We celebrate with Stephen on his latest achievement and hold him in the joyous light of our beloved community this morning. Rabbi Geller will lead us in moments of meditation and reflection, followed by our time for silent meditation. Passover tells the story that culminates in the crossing of the Sea of Reeds. You remember the story. Pharaoh's army is behind us. The sea is in front of us. We can't go back. We can't go forward. We're stuck until one brave man, Nachshon, the son of Aminadav, steps into the water, walking slowly 
slowly, slowly until the water is up to his neck. And then the sea parts. There's a story from Jewish tradition about two guys who were part of that mass of people crossing through the sea of reeds as it opens, this miracle. Here's the story. These two people, Ruvain and Shimon, hurried among the crowd that was crossing through the sea. They never once looked up. They noticed only that the ground under their feet was a little muddy. Yuck, said Ruvain. There's mud all over this place. Ugh, said Shimon. I have muck covering my feet. This is terrible, Ruvain said. When we were slaves in Egypt, we had to make bricks out of mud just like this. Yes, said Shimon. There's no difference between being a slave in Egypt and being free here. Looking at the ground and missing the miracle that is going on all around us. As we move into the silence of meditation, you might want to think about those times when you can identify with Ruvain and Shimon, missing the miracle because you're so focused on the whatever it is on the ground. Or you might want to focus on the question, what gave you the strength to go forward into waters that felt like they were over your head? Or you might want to focus on the theme of Passover. What do you need to do to continue your journey into freedom? I invite you now into silence.
Passover is the most celebrated of all Jewish holidays. And there are lots of reasons for that. First, you do it at home. You don't need a temple. You don't need a rabbi. Second, it involves eating, something that most Jews love to do. Third, it involves talking, telling stories, something we love even better than eating. We tell the story with the help of the Haggadah. I brought two examples. There are lots of different versions of the Haggadah. Haggadah is Hebrew for the telling, and it's the liturgy that we share around the table at the Passover Seder, with ancient texts, with songs, with contemporary readings, and with poetry. As Jeremiah said, Passover works on so many levels. It works as a reminder of our history. And although the story that's told in the Hebrew Bible is not actually history, it is our origin story. We were slaves, so we must fight against all forms of oppression. That's the historical level. And it works on a political level about the meaning and the possibility of politics. As the philosopher Michael Walzer said in his amazing book, Exodus and Revolution, first, that wherever you live, it's probably Egypt. Second, that there is a better place, a world more attractive, a promised land. And third, that the way to that land is through the wilderness. There's no way to get from here to there except by joining together and marching. And then it works on a psychological level. Every person has an Egypt, a narrow place. The Hebrew word Mitzrayim literally means narrow place. So coming out of Egypt is the coming out of whatever narrow place we might be in. That place that keeps us from being free. So each year we struggle with our own liberation from that narrow place. That's the psychological level. And then it works on a spiritual level because it calls on us to ask, what does freedom really mean? And finally, Passover is the most celebrated of all Jewish holidays because it's a way for us to measure our own growth. Think about it, those of you who grew up in a tradition of having Passover. Over our lifetimes, Jews sit in every chair around the Passover table. When we're little, we ask the four questions. And then we grow up a little, and we watch a younger sibling or a cousin get all the attention as she or he asks those questions. And then eventually, we grow up. And the Seder moves to our house, the family recipes to our kitchens. We sit in the chairs where our mothers or fathers once sat. It is our children or other young people in our lives who are asking the questions. And then it's our grandchildren with our children, now the grown-ups, explaining to their children, this is what God did for me when I went free from Egypt. Teaching young people from generation to generation because of what God did for me. And that's really powerful. I mean, you physically see that as you grow up over your life. So really, one of the central texts of the Haggadah is this text. 
In every generation, one is obligated to see oneself as one who personally went out from Mitzrayim, that narrow place. Just as it says in the book of Exodus, chapter 13, you shall tell your child on that day, it is because of this that God did for me when I went out of Egypt. What God did for me when I went out of Egypt. So the work of Passover is to really look upon ourselves as though we did come out of Egypt, the historical, the political Egypts in our world, our emotional Egypts, our own personal spiritual narrow places, to look upon ourselves. And then in the 12th century, Maimonides, famous Jewish theologian, pushes us further and says, let's change one word in that, the word lirot, to see, to leharot, to show. Not just to see ourselves as though we had come out of Egypt, but to show ourselves, to show to other people, our own children, if we have them, other people's children who are part of our lives, to show by how we live that we came forth from Egypt. So wherever we are, we're never completely stuck. Change is always possible. And that we can live our lives with empathy for others and with a commitment to create a better world. So you've been all following the news as I have the night of watching, the biblical story of the night of watching. Boy, last night was a night of watching. I checked in with all of my family and friends in Israel. The parallel to the story of Passover is so unbelievably close that it's sort of hard to breathe. And I need to acknowledge that Passover this year is particularly hard because of how much pain there is in our world. In the Haggadah, in the story around the table, we'll chant the words, Vihi Sha'amda. In every generation, there have been those who sought to wipe us out. I feel that so powerfully this year. The terrorism and the brutality of the Hamas attack the escalation of anti-Semitism in our country and around the world. This is real. And in the same liturgy, we'll chant, let all who are hungry come and eat. And I can't hide from the famine and the devastation being perpetrated on innocent civilians in Gaza that are being carried out in my name. That's part of what I bring to Passover this year carried out in my name by the government of Israel. And we'll lift a cup of wine as we chant the 10 plagues, and we take a drop of wine out of the cup and put it on our plate for each of the 10 plagues. Wine is a symbol of joy, so we're lessening our wine, our joy at the Passover Seder because of the deaths of innocent Egyptian. And then we read the story of God's anger at the angels who rejoiced as Pharaoh's armies are drowning in the Sea of Reeds. And God says, according to the tradition, angels, how can you rejoice? My children, the Egyptians, are drowning. All of these complicated feelings I and so many others bring to this moment, rage, fear, shock, shame, confusion, empathy, it's all there in this moment. And Passover opens our hearts, my heart, to remember that change is possible. The way things are, are not 
the way it has to be. The power of Passover. In fact, the whole structure of the Haggadah is to ask questions. Those famous four questions that the littlest kid asks, they're meant to be examples of questions that you ask. Not those particular questions, but these are examples of questions so that you think about what questions you're bringing to the Passover Seder. And the commentary makes clear that the point of the questions is to get the younger children to notice how different everything is that night. What we eat, how we sit, we're supposed to recline. If young people don't immediately get that something is different. Then we're supposed to do something outrageous to really get their attention, like to eat dessert first, yeah. or in one of the commentaries, to pull the uh, um, tablecloth out from under all of the dishes so that kids will say, what? Manishtana, what's going on here? What's different here? And why is it different? What are we supposed to be learning? So there's a famous story. Isidore I. Rabi, a Nobel laureate in physics, was once asked, why did you become a physicist instead of a doctor, a lawyer, or a businessman like the other immigrant kids in the neighborhood? His answer, my mother. <laughs> my mother, without ever intending it, Every other Jewish mother in Brooklyn would ask her child after school, no, did you learn anything today? Not my mother, he said. She would say, Izzy, did you ask a good question today? That difference, asking good questions, made me become a scientist. We eat the story of Passover. Matzah, flour that's baked for less than 18 minutes into this dry, flat bread because our ancestors didn't have time for their bread to rise as they left Egypt. Matzah, which is simultaneously both the bread of affliction, poor people's bread, but it's also the symbol of freedom. Karpas, green vegetable, spring, reminding, as Jeremiah reminded us at the opening of the service, this green spring vegetable, which we dip into salt water, because salt water reminds us of tears. Spring and tears. Spring, renewal, and loss. Maror, the bitter herbs that represent slavery. Haroset, this delicious mixture of apples, nuts, cinnamon, sometimes dates, depending on where you are from in the old country, what recipes you inherited from your family. Reminding us the mortar that the Israelites used to make bricks, slavery, but also the sweetness of apple trees, possibility. We dip the maror into the haroset, mixing the bitter and the sweet because both are part of our lives. We eat the story. All of these and a shank bone that reminds us of the sacrifices that the biblical story tells us to acknowledge. And if you're a vegetarian, which I am, a beet, because you don't want to use a shank bone, so instead you use a beet. Why a beet? Because it sort of bleeds, right? <laughs> so that's why it has taken the place of a um, shank bone in a vegetarian seder. And an egg, a symbol of renewal, rebirth, and in many contemporary seders, other objects are included, 
So I brought a Seder plate. And it says all the things that you put on a Seder plate, right? This has been going on for as long as Passover Seders have been observed. But now there are new things that some people put on their Seder plate. In my Seder, for many years, we have included an orange. Why an orange? Because it's a symbol of inclusion. If you think about how an orange exists, they're like separate sections, but they are all connected to remind us that the community is a very diverse community, all different kinds of people. The orange initially came to be on a Seder plate to specifically acknowledge the inclusion of women in the center of the story and also LGBTQ folks in the center of the story. And now it has come to represent the biggest tent imaginable of what it means to be part of the Jewish community. So what's interesting about that to me is that traditions change. You don't get rid of the old, but you transform the old by adding new. One year in my Seder, we asked our guests to bring an object to the Seder to put on the Seder plate, an object that represented both slavery and freedom. A black pastor brought a sign from a motel in his childhood neighborhood in the South that said, no Jews or blacks allowed. Clearly, that was a symbol of slavery. But for him, it was also a sign of freedom because it was that sign and all that it represented that propelled him into a life committed to work for social justice. And another guest brought a cell phone. <laughs> freedom, yes, no question. Slavery. A third brought a jar of olives, linking him to the struggle for coexistence with Palestinians. Let me conclude with one more tradition. After the meal, the tradition is that we open the door to welcome Elijah, the prophet who, according to Jewish tradition, will welcome the messianic possibility. So we want to bring Elijah into our homes to signal that there could be a different kind of world. And when you're in a little kid, you fill this cup, it's a cup of wine, and you watch, because Elijah, of course, is invisible, <laughs> and you want to sort of see, is he really drinking, right? Now, it takes a while till you figure that if Elijah is really drinking from all of the cups for Elijah in the neighborhood, he, by the time he gets to my house, is so drunk that <laughs> it would be impossible to imagine what it means to welcome the messianic possibility. But just in case you miss it, one of the traditions that comes from the Middle Ages actually is you start with an empty cup and you ask people around the table to take some of their wine and pour it into Elijah's cup to symbolize that this new world is only going to happen if all of us together contribute to the fulfillment, the filling of that cup. There's a new tradition. This is Miriam's cup. Uh, you can't see it, but it says Miriam, and there's an image of a woman dancing. You all know the story that it was Miriam who led us in the singing as we made it safely through the sea. She took out her timbrel, her tambourine. You have to, like, how wise she was 
to know that when you're leaving Egypt, in addition to your matzah, <laughs> you also need to bring something that will help you dance, something that will help you rejoice. We need to be prepared, and we need to anticipate the possibility of joy. So I want to just say one word about Miriam and her connection to our story of Passover. It's in the Talmud, the source of Jewish law. It says, we were redeemed from Egypt because of the righteousness of the women of that generation. But it doesn't tell us which women. Which women would it be? The first women to be mentioned in the biblical story are Shifra and Pua, the midwives. The midwives who defy Pharaoh's rule that you have to kill all the Hebrew boys. And they defy him according to the tradition with the story. Those Israelite women, they're so healthy that they give birth before we get there. They risk their lives to save these Jewish babies. The first act of civil disobedience that is recorded in an ancient text. Who were these midwives? The text isn't clear. It said they were midwives to the Hebrews. Were they Israelite women? Or were they Egyptian women who were midwives to the Hebrew women? The text isn't clear. But the point that that kind of courage is what changes the world is very clear. And then there are other women in the story. The Torah says in Exodus chapter 2, a certain man of the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. She bore a son and hid him for three months. Who was the son? Moses, Moses right? But isn't that a little weird? A certain man, a certain woman, married, she gets pregnant and has a baby. But we know from the biblical story that they're already married. They have a daughter already. Who's the daughter? Miriam, right? They have a other son. Who's the other son? Aaron, right? So what's going on here? What does it mean they got married? So Midrash, rabbinic commentary, fills in the story. Times were tough for the Israelites because Pharaoh had decreed that the boys would be killed. So Amram and Yochevet, Moses' parents, decide not to risk bringing children into this horrible world. How can you even imagine bringing children into a world like this? A question, by the way, that some of the young people in our lives are asking as well. The rabbinic story, the Midrash, tells us that Miriam, although she's a little girl, maybe she's five or six, she challenges her father. She says, Daddy, you're worse than Pharaoh. Pharaoh ordered the death of Hebrew boys, but you, what you and mom are doing, leads to the death of girls as well. And you're leaders of the community, and so if you divorce each other, there won't be another generation. What you're doing is wrong. She spoke truth to power. Amram was convinced by his wise daughter, so he went and married his wife again. And so Moses was born. And that's how the story explains this sort of strange gap in the biblical text. She bore a son and hid him for three months. 
When she could hide him no longer, she got a wicker basket, put the child in it, and placed it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. You all know the story. I'm reading from the text itself. And his sister stationed herself at a distance to learn what would happen. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came to bathe in the Nile. This daughter of Pharaoh, she doesn't have a name in the story. She's simply called Bat Paro, the daughter of Pharaoh. But she's clearly a wealthy and powerful Egyptian. She sees this basket, and she hears a baby crying. She knows it's a Hebrew baby. It's quite clear from the text. She knows it's a Hebrew baby. She knows that her father has ordered the death of all Hebrew babies. And yet, she reaches for the basket and rescues the baby. She reaches over race, class, religion, and power to defy her own father to save a human life. And the rabbis who love words play with the ambiguous word here, amata. Pharaoh's daughter saw the basket, v'tishlach et amata, literally, and she sent her maidservant to get it. She sends her maid to rescue this baby. But amata, the word, can also mean arm leading the rabbis to describe that Pharaoh's daughter stretched out her own arm and it became long enough to save this baby. We learn from this that our arms are always long enough to reach out to another human being. And then Miriam approaches the daughter of Pharaoh and she says, Excuse me, this little girl, this powerful woman. Excuse me, you need a wet nurse for that baby. I know just the woman. So Miriam brings Yocheved to nurse her own son. Does Pharaoh's daughter know that Miriam is the sister? That the nurse is the mother? Is this a conspiracy of women working together quietly, powerfully to change human history because they all see the face of God in each other and in this baby? We were redeemed from Egypt because of the righteousness of the women. These women and the other women of that generation, they didn't despair no matter how harsh the conditions of slavery were. Our Midrash tells us that these women went into the fields where their husbands were slave laborers. Their husbands were exhausted. They were wasted. They were almost dead. And these women took their husbands to those apple trees, Haroset, to arouse their husbands so that life could go on and new generations would be born. And according to the story, they used mirrors to arouse their husbands. I mean, there's this lovely little story of playful foreplay uh, using mirrors, you know, who's the more beautiful, me or you? And, and that led to the intimacy that created another generation. Later, when the Mishkan, the holy sanctuary, was being built, people brought mirrors as offerings. And at first, Moses didn't want to accept those mirrors because what does vanity have to do in a sacred place? And according to the story, Moses is instructed by God, no, these mirrors absolutely belong because without them and the courage of these women, we wouldn't be building a Mishkan today. We were redeemed 
because of the righteousness of the women. Shifra, Pua, Miriam, Yocheved, the daughter of Pharaoh, Egyptian women and Hebrew women, and all the other mothers and wives and sisters throughout history who never lost hope, no matter what was going on in the world. And so we fill Miriam's cup with water. Because according to the biblical story, it was Miriam's wells that sustained the Israelites in our journey through the wilderness. Water, clarity, simplicity, life. And this year, as in other years, guests at my Seder will be invited to remember these brave midwives, Shifra and Pua. And around the table, we will each nominate a contemporary person for our annual imaginary award for nonviolent resistance to tyranny. Who would you give the Shifra and Pua award to this year? What person in the world this year do we want to honor in our thoughts, in our conversation, as models for making a difference? The power of Passover is to question what is and to work toward what could be and to do that together. So for those of you who celebrate Passover and for those of you who don't, may this season of Passover be liberating. Amen. Thank you, Rabbi Geller, for that powerful and inspiring message. The abundance of the springtime is ours to enjoy and share. As Reverend Peter Rabel so eloquently reminds us, we build, found, we build on foundations we did not lay. We warm ourselves by fires we did not light. We sit in the shade of trees we did not plant. We drink from wells we did not dig. This is the abundance we receive, and it is the abundance we are called to share. We are a generous, generous congregation, and half of this morning's offering will go to support the good work of this congregation, and half will be shared with an organization furthering our mission and liberal religious principles in the wider world. In our congregational home, the generosity of community supports our caring pastoral care team, which is ready to lend a listening ear and loving heart to anyone in need of confidential spiritual companionship. You can request this kind of pastoral care from our team of volunteer leaders by emailing pastoralcare at uusm.org or by calling the church office. This month, we share our plate with the Rainforest Action Network. The Rainforest Action Network preserves forests, protects the climate, and upholds human rights by challenging corporate powers and systemic injustice through frontline partnerships and strategic campaigns. RAN works towards a world where the rights and dignity of all communities are respected and where healthy forests, a stable climate, and wild biodiversity are protected and celebrated. There are many ways you can give, which you will find on the slide behind me. You can use text to give. Cash and checks are also, of course, welcome. We will now give and receive this morning's offering. I invite our ushers to come forward.
please rise in body or in spirit for our closing hymn, number 260. forth into this day through those narrow places, those narrow places within, those narrow places within our world, and into the spaciousness, into the expanse of hope and possibility, into the spaciousness of a promised land that is yet to be. May you go forth led by the Shekinah, the divine feminine force within all, and resting upon this place and helping to make it holy. May you go forth into this day and be blessed, and may you be a blessing. Amen. Amen.